Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you again for joining us for uh, our fourth session of the Connect Home Revolution series. Uh, I don't think Chris needs an introduction again, uh, but as always, we're very honored to have him join us and to lead this uh, series. Just a reminder of uh, the basic housekeeping. Uh, if you could save any questions for the end or type into the chat bar, uh, and you'll see on the screen, I've just made a note that all the sessions are CPD accredited and we'll distribute the certificates at the end of the series. Um, and the, if you have any questions, you can email us uh, at netcare lecture series at netcare.co.za. Um, and all the recordings are available on YouTube and I'll post the link into the chat bar as well. Uh, otherwise, Chris, all over to you. Welcome everyone and good evening. And thank you for joining us uh, again tonight. Sorry, Chris, you want to just uh, switch your screens around? We're seeing your presenter screen. Uh, just display settings and then swap displays, I think. Is that, is that better, Chris? Uh, yeah, just uh, start presenting and we have a look quick. Yeah, there we go. Uh, good evening again, and thanks for joining us tonight. Um, the fourth uh, lecture in the series is going to focus on the insula, the opercula surrounding it, and the temporal lobe. And we're going to talk about the structure function, but with a lot of emphasis on the actual parcellation map uh, of this part of the brain. Uh, I'm going to show a case, but I'm going to keep that uh, at the end of the um, of this talk, uh, just because we're going to apply a lot of the information we learned today into how in to interpret a, a case with uh, dementia. Okay, so if we look at the insula, it was first uh, described by Johann Christian Rail, and he thought of it as an island of cortex, and we now call it the island of Rail. And it's an important structure which is hidden away. It's in the depths of the sylvian fissure and it's covered by three opercula, the frontal, the temporal and the parietal opercula. When we look at its connectomic anatomy, uh, we're gonna see that it's got 16 parcellations. Um, and when we include the opercula, the total comes to 29. And that's a very interesting structure. As you remember on our architectonic lecture, the second one, the insula is the beginning of the neopallium. So we said it's the beginning of the new six layered cortex. However, because it's the beginning of where that cortex originated, we've also got older areas of cortex. And this can be seen when you separate the insula into a posterior part and an anterior part. The posterior part is granular, so it has uh, six layers and it's uh, reminiscent of the neopallium. And that's connected to spinal cord, brainstem by the um, thalamus, but also connected to the temporal, parietal and occipital association cortices. And it's very important as a combining factor of somatosensory, vestibular and motor information. Interesting of the anterior part of the insula is the agranular insula. So it's the older insula, which doesn't necessarily have the six layers. And this is a part of the brain that's it's a hub and it connects to our network. So the uh, default mode network and the central executive network via that salience network that we talked about. And it's actually got the important uh, function of integrating all our visceral and autonomic information and putting it together to, to give us an emotional and cognitive and motivational understanding of our bodies and how we feel. And it's also deeply connected to the limbic areas. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail with some pictures. So if we're looking at the insula, um, there's a model that looks at the information flow. And as is present in other parts of the brain, there's a posterior to anterior information flow. So the posterior granular part of the insula receives low level sensory information from other parts of the brain. And then this gets processed um, anteriorly and it becomes increasingly complex and more um, sophisticated and it gives right a rise to an emergent property called interoception. So what is interoception? 
Uh, interoception is the ability uh, of our brains uh, to map our, our bodies into certain states and they can assign subjective feelings to that. So essentially it's the basis of selfhood, of understanding who we are. And that's got very important implications because by understanding how, we how we're feeling and assigning a, a state to our feelings, uh, we can have joy, we can have sorrow, uh, pleasure um, or pain. And this is very important because it's important in uh, how we're able to understand events and cognition. So if we have certain uh, events or stimuli and we're able to understand them and give them a context, if they're joyful or they're pleasurable or they're giving us pain, we're able to assign salience to them. So how important they are. On top of that, um, we're also able to influence our motivation, our explicit motivation based on the salience or the importance that we put on events, which is based on the feelings that they induce. So what the insula is able to do is assign salience to um, events or stimuli. And based on how we feel about them, we can decide if, if we're going to engage in a certain behavior or be motivated to pursue that feeling or, or if we're going to um, feel averse to it and not engage with it. So based on interoception of understanding ourselves, the insula is able to integrate that to different parts of the brain, specifically the, the frontal uh, lobe, uh, with, and integrate that with cognition and motivation. Um, so how does that work? Well, the insula is a hub, so we get basic information as we discuss based six sensory information, we, uh, that progresses anteriorly and becomes increasingly complex and gives rise to the feeling of interoception. So understanding ourselves and having certain feelings about the information. Now, what we can do is we can connect this part of the insula through that salience network we talked about weeks ago to the lateral prefrontal cortex via the central executive network. And what we can do is basically um, divert attention and working memory to that information that's arising from the, from the insula. Um, conversely, that, inf that interoceptive information in the anterior insula can be connected by the uh, default mode network to the um, ventromedial parts of the frontal cortex. And what that connection does is it uses our experiences. So have we felt this type of feeling previously uh, and related that to a certain event. And if we have, we're gonna use that information to influence our, our future actions based on uh, that experience of the feelings that we had. So ultimately what the insula does, it's, it makes us feel ourselves and helps us relate that feeling to our own bodies and to our environments and, and, our, um, and the universe at large. And we can gain important um, insights from different pathological conditions. So if we look at uh, people with major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder, uh, lots of studies have shown that there's significant gray matter reduction in the insula. Um, and also when we study the resting state uh, connectivity, we find that there's a lot of aberrations in how the insula is connected to other parts of the brain uh, when you compare them to, to normal people. Uh, we also find differences in schizophrenia and autism where that salience network we talked about in the initial weeks which we said is able to separate our brains from a default mode network and a central executive network is not working properly and what happens is we're not able to separate our brains clearly into either a default mode network a mode or a central executive network mode and in essence, we're unable to, um, to assign salience to events. Um, it's also been shown to have lots of abnormalities in people with drug addiction or anhedonia, uh, because remember, we said the insula also plays an important role in, in motivation. So an, an insula that's not working problem might give uh, um, a lot of motivation towards drug seeking behavior, which is abnormal, or in someone with anhedonia, that they have an inability to gain motivation and engage in activities. 
Okay, so let's look at the gross anatomy of the insula, and then we'll get into the parcellation map of the insula. So in, in this picture here, what we've done is we've removed the frontal operculum, the parietal uh, operculum, and the temporal operculum, and we're looking at that insula, the island of rail. And what we've got is a circular sulcus, which surrounds the entire insula. We've got a central sulcus that breaks it down into a posterior insula, which is the basic sensation, and an anterior insula, which forms that interoceptive uh, function. And what we've got is short insular gyri in the anterior part and long insular gyri in the posterior part. Um, this is quite complex and a nice way to actually uh, think of this part of the brain is as a triangle. Um, and what we've got is an anterior superior angle or otherwise uh, known as an anterior superior apex. And then the areas associated with that apex that we'll look from a connectomic point of view is the anterior insula, the frontal operculum uh, that covers it, otherwise known as the FOP regions, and also the middle insula. The posterior parietal apex that we will look at um, allows us to split the insula into posterior insular areas, OP or opercular areas, uh, retro insula, and supramarginal regions. Finally, it, it's a, a good way of thinking of the structure is as a hypotenuse um, of, of the triangle. And the temporal hypotenuse has the long gyri. It has the circular sulcus inferiorly, which has parcellations, uh, the opercular superior temporal gyrus, and the plane and pilare, which is part of the superior surface of the temporal lobe. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look in detail in a lot of these parcellations and what they do. So the first part we're gonna look at is the anterior apex region and specifically the insular region, which has four parcellations. So we've got the piriform cortex, we've got the anterior agranular insular cortex. So again, it's agranular, old insula, anterior ventral insula and the middle insula. And these parcellations are connected to the superior longitudinal uh, fasciculus, which, as we said, surrounds that sylvian fissure. So it's not surprising that it connects to, to these parts of the brain. Now, if we look at function, the, piri the pirif uh, piriform cortex area of the insula is the largest area receiving olfactory input. Uh, it allows us to discriminate between odors. Uh, it allows us to enforce olfactory memories. And it's also important for distributing olfactory information to the rest of the brain. Now the interoceptive areas, are the areas that allow us to understand who we are in terms of ourselves, um, are the AI, AAIC, um, uh, middle insula and the anterior ventral insula. And these three areas were separated from each other based on functional MRI um, studies in the parcellation map. So as we said, they're important for interoception. Uh, they're important for time perception. And a study by Richter um, et al in 2017 also showed that they have a, a very important connection with our enteric nervous system. They're actually able to phase in with a cell called the interstitial uh, cell of Cajal in the enteric nervous system. And they form a, a gastric pacemaker activity so they're able to keep in sync with the intrinsic gut rhythm, uh, which is very important. And it's, it's a way that the enteric nervous system communicates information back into the brain and lets us um, understand better our internal state. The next part of the brain we're gonna talk about is the frontal operculum, i.e. the part of the frontal lobe that covers the insula so although we talked about the frontal lobe and we looked at the parcellations on the lateral surface, when you actually lift that operculum, there's lots of different parcellations on the undersurface of the brain. There's uh, five frontal opercular operations, uh, um, parcellations, uh, one, two, three, four, and five. And there's also area 43. Again, no surprise, they're connected to the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which is one of the major brain uh, white matter tracts we talked about. Uh, the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, which connects the frontal lobe to the occipital lobe, and also the frontal aslant tract, which connects that inferior frontal lobe area to the superior frontal lobe. Now, when we look at the functions, 
So area 44 is in that inferior frontal gyrus. And it's actually no surprise that these areas, FOP two to five, are actually extensions of that broker's area. So they're very important for the initiation of uh, language. But what they also do is they allow us to retrieve uh, new words that we learn. So anytime we learn a new word, they allow us to enforce that and help us retrieve those new words. Um, and again, these areas were parcelated from each other based on fMRI studies that looked at uh, motor tasks, uh, arithmetic and different semantic tasks. Now, the FOP, so the frontal opercular area one, is what I call the gamer's uh, parcellation. What it does is that it allows us to imagine ourselves when we're doing abstract movement in the third person. So if, you're, if you think of a gamer playing a, a computer game, a role playing game, where they're um, shooting someone, um, uh, different soldiers or different imag imaginary beings, that's what they're actually doing. So they're imagining themselves from a third person and doing uh, different types of movements. So that's what that parcellation actually does. Uh, finally, parcellation 43 is, is close to that uh, presential gyrus, which is the motor area, but it actually is responsible for the motor control of swallowing. And I've certainly had one or two patients with meningiomas or tumors in this area, which although they have no other motor fallout, they've, they've struggled a lot with swallowing and have presented that way, which is very interesting to note. And it's actually connectomics that has, that has taught us about this. Okay, so we're gonna move on from that anterior superior apex to that uh, posterior parietal apex region. And that region, as we said, it involves the posterior insula and the parietal opercula. And there's five parcellations in this area. There's insular granular cortex, so the new cortex, which has the six layers. We have OP1, 2, 3, which is one parcellation and four and then uh, the parietal area, F central uh, medial. Again, being around the sylvian fissure, these parcellations are connected by the superior longitudinal fasciculus. Okay, so what do they do? So the, uh, the Ig area uh, is important. So the granular area is, is important as a gustatory center of the brain. So it links a lot of gustatory information to, to create that, that experience. And again, it's, it's a sensory area. Now, OP uh, one, two, three, and four, which are around that operculum, are higher sensory areas. So they're integrating sensory information from the primary sensory cortex and other areas um, situated around that posterior insula. And then they're gonna send that information um, anteriorly to create the feeling of interoception. Interestingly, OP1, that's important for bimanual tasks. So when we're using both of our hands to perform uh, an activity. And what's interesting about it, two, um, two weeks ago, we talked about the frontal lobe and we talked about the, the paracentral lobule, uh, which is the other side of the brain and related to the premotor cortex. And that had area, um, the, the, the area fives, um, and they were responsible for bimanual tasks. So on either side of the primary motor cortex, we've got a parcellations that are involved in bimanual tasks, which is just an interesting deduction. Uh, finally, PFCM is a language area. So it's res uh, responsible for vocabulary, how we articulate um, and semantics. So the other area in the parietal apex region is the retroinsular area and the supramarginal gyrus area. And that's got seven parcellations and associated essentially with the primary auditory areas. And, and we'll talk about that now. Connection wise, again, that superior longitudinal fasciculus, which rotates around that sylvian fissure. And then we've also got a, a connection between the occipital lobe and the posterior superior temporal lobe called the middle longitudinal fasciculus. Um, so the parcellations are retroinsular, A1 primary uh, auditory cortex, area 52, um, a lateral, medial and posterior belt. And then we've got two parcellations around the angular cortex called the perisylvian language area and the superior uh, temporal uh, visual area. 
So what do they do? So um, retroinsular area or RI is an auditory associ uh, association cortex area, but it also receives, in addition to auditory information, some somewhat sensory input. Area 52 was parcellated based on functional MRIs and arithmetic and auditory tasks, but we're not quite sure what it does at present. And A1 is the primary auditory area. So this is the area where all our auditory information flies into. It's got a tonotopic map of the, of the cochlea, and it receives all that information from the medial geniculate ganglion of the, of the thalamus. M-belt, P-belt, and L-belt, uh, again, new areas that were parcelated from the primary auditory cortex based on resting state fMRI tasks. Now, the PSL and STV, they're very important um, areas uh, which are involved in higher cognition. So they integrate a lot of the surrounding information to form higher cognition. And they're important for essential information processing, uh, for cognitive control, uh, language generation, and integrating all of our audiovisual information. So we're going to move to the final part of the triangle, the hypotenuse part, which has seven parcellations involving the circular sulcus, the uh, temporal operculum, and the surrounding areas. And the parcellations in this area are posterior insula one and two, which are underneath that central sulcus of the insula and a part of those long insula uh, gyri. There's area four and five, which are auditory associ association areas. Interestingly, what you'll note, there's an A1 and A4 and A5, but there's no A2 um, or three. And finally, we've got some parcellations in the area called the uh, planum temporale. And what we've got is a perinsular area, a TA2, and superior gyrus uh, area anteriorly, or STGA. Again, we've got the superior longitudinal fasciculus uh, connections, which go around that sylvian sulcus. We've got that middle longitudinal fasciculus, which connects the occipital lobe to the upper superior part of the uh, temporal lobe. And then we've also got the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, which connects the occipital lobe to the temporal pole inferiorly. So what do these areas do? Um, again, being more of a posterior insula, so POI uh, one and two, they process secondary sensory input and, and get it ready for transmission to the anterior insula for interoception. A periinsular area I is interesting, and that's an, uh, uh, what that does is it's also important interoception, and it actually becomes very active when we're exposed to extreme heat. So the body uh, is able to communicate to that part of the brain and, and warn it that we're actually in, a, in a very hot circumstances. A4, A5, as well as STGA, uh, auditory association areas. And interestingly, what they do is they allow us to uh, process conceptual acoustic sounds. So if, you, if you're looking at a horror movie and, you, um, and it's got that very quick, sudden, loud music, uh, which preludes to a horror scene, it's that part of the brain that gives context to that sound. And, and makes us understand that there's a horror scene coming up. Conversely, if we're looking at a serene sort of scene in a movie and they've got that gentle acoustic mu uh, music, that's the part of the brain that interprets that. Uh, finally, uh, for the temporal hypotenuse, so TA2, it's actually a transition cortex between primary auditory cortex and secondary auditory, auditory cortex. And interestingly, it's got different functions from the left and the right side. So the left side actually processes sounds that change quickly, uh, and that allows us to understand beginning and ending of words when we're talking. Whereas the right side assesses the tone of the speech. What's very interesting when you look at the, the Chinese languages like Mandarin, which are heavily tonal, there's a lot more emphasis on the tonal aspect of speech. And what's interesting is that generally uh, the, the Chinese uh, languages, they don't, lateralized to the left side that they've got bilateral lateralization yeah, and that's very interesting okay so we finished the insula um, and then as you can see it's quite a complex structure and we'll move on to the temporal lobe as explained these parcellation maps are hectic and no one's expected to know every parcellation and what it does 
um, especially in the context of how we've sort of been introducing the concept of analyzing connectomes. But what it does, it just gives us a broad overview to try and comprehend the science behind how we're creating these parcellation maps. So temporal lobe has 31 parcellations. And when we look at its functions, it's got the primary auditory cortex. It's got auditory association cortex, which you've already seen on that superior temporal gyrus and operculum. It's got visual association cortex and the limbic areas uh, medially. And like the insula, where we saw there's a hierarchy of information from posterior to anterior, this pattern carries on into the temporal lobe, where we've got our, our ventral uh, visual pathway, which begins to process uh, basic visual features posteriorly. Um, as they progress anteriorly, they become more complex shapes. And at the poles, they start gaining meaning. So what do these shapes mean? It's the same for the auditory information. So simple auditory elements posteriorly where we saw A1, and as they start traveling more anterior, anteriorly, they become increasingly uh, complex. When we look at pathological conditions that affect the temporal lobe, a condition that stands out is semantic dementia, where we get a lot of atrophy or hypermetabolism in the ventral lateral and anterior temporal lobe. And what we see is, uh, is a consistent deterioration of uh, multimodal semantic representation. So those patients really struggle to tie in all this information and uh, sensory input and make meaning out of it. Okay, so let's look at the anatomy of the temporal lobe. So superiorly, we've got the sylvian fissure, which separates the temporal lobe from our frontal and parietal lobes. And then we've got a parietal occipital uh, notch, which allows us to create an imaginary um, line, a uh, preoccipital notch, which allows us to create an imaginary line with the parietal occipital sulcus to make the posterior border. What we've got is a superior temporal gyrus, a middle temporal gyrus, and an inferior temporal gyrus. And those are separated uh, through a superior temporal sulcus and an inferior temporal sulcus. How do we relate this to a connectomic map? Well, um, we've got a parcellation map of four parcellations called the STS areas, uh, which is the superior temporal sulcus areas. We've got the T1 areas, which occupy the middle temporal gyrus. And then we've got the T2 areas, which are, occupy the inferior temporal uh, gyrus. They also occupy the inferior temporal sulcus. And uh, um, medially, what they do is they occupy the occipital temporal sulcus. So these carry on to be the T2 areas. Going back to the basic anatomy. So on the inferior medial part of the temporal lobe, we've got the inferior temporal uh, gyrus as well, separated by the occipital temporal sulcus. And then we've got a very interesting structure which connects the temporal lobe to the occipital lobe called the fusiform gyrus. And we'll see why that's interesting a bit later. And that's separated from a collateral sulcus uh, at that separates the parahippocampal gyrus from the fusiform uh, gyrus medially. Uh, medially, we've, we've got the uncus and we've got the temporal pole anteriorly. So if we carry on with our parcellation scheme, the temporal pole areas are called the TG areas and the medial temporal areas are just the medial temporal areas. Okay, so let's look at these regions in more detail. As I explained, um, earlier, we've already covered the superior temporal uh, gyrus as part of the temporal operculum for the insula. So we're going to start with the superior temporal sulcus areas. So STSDA for dorsal anterior, DP for dorsal posterior, and VA and v VP for ventral anterior and ventral posterior. And, and these are very important parcellations, uh, which are connected to the superior longitudinal fasciculus, uh, which is no surprise there and the middle longitudinal fasciculus, which connects this area to the occipital lobe. And the important areas, because essentially they're an extended vernicus area. Uh, they're important for semantic, proce semantic processing of all the auditory input, together with the areas on that superior temporal gyrus, such as A45 and STGA and TA2, which we discussed earlier. Um, when we're looking at a classical vernicus area, we're talking about the STSDP. Uh, 
But what's interesting is when we think of Wernicke, we generally think of comprehension of language, uh, which we tend to think is comprehension of sounds, but it's not just that. STSDP also looks at facial expression and people's motions as they're talking to make a global map of what people are saying. So we're integrating lots of different audiovisual information to, to build a comprehension. It's not just simply understanding words of speech. STSDA uh, is responsible for a lot of these uh, functions, i.e. speech, uh, facial and motion processing as well as the audiovisual integration. But it's also important for another very, very important property, uh, which without this, we, we wouldn't be able to interact socially. And that's it's responsible for theory of mind. And what theory of mind is, it's a concept which allows us as humans to assign mental states to ourselves and our others. And based on assessing our own mental state and other people's mental states, uh, we're able to interact. Imagine to, talking to someone and you, know, you couldn't quite piece together if they're angry or they're upset. Um, so by assigning mental states, we're able to predict other people's actions. And it's this area here together with another parcellation we'll see a bit later, which is responsible for this theory of mind concept. Okay, so we're going to move on to the in, um, to the T1 areas uh, from the middle temporal uh, gyrus, which have four parcellations. Uh, so there's T1A, T1M, T1P, which stands for temporal area E1, and then uh, PHT posteriorly. Surpri surprise, surprise, they're connected by the superior longitudinal fasciculus as expected. Um, but now we, we're starting to be connected by both the middle uh, longitudinal fasciculus and the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. So the middle temporal gyrus is actually connected by all three major um, longitudinal brain tracts of the brain. Now, function-wise, T1A is different to the others posteriorly because that's responsible for active language tasks. Whereas the T1P, T1M and uh, PhD they're responsible for the ventral visual pathway. So that's the what pathway. So we have visual information posteriorly, and then that goes anteriorly through the ventral visual pathway for us to start recognizing options. Um, uh, sorry, starting to recognize objects. So T1 MNP is responsible for object recognition. Uh, T1P also has the added value of facial uh, recognition. And what PHT does, it's able to integrate with the task positive networks, i.e. the central executive network and not the, the default mode network. So the major function of the middle um, temporal uh, gyrus is that ventral watt path, pathway of vision. Now we're gonna move on to the inferior frontal gyrus, um, the inferior temporal sulcus and the um, occipital temporal sulcus with the T2 areas and the TF areas. And these are connected by the superior longitudinal fasciculus and inferior longitudinal fasciculus. And when we're looking at function, uh, the T2A and T, the T2A and 2P is the same like the T21 areas where they're responsible for the ventral watch pathway of vision. So figuring out what things are by looking at them. And T2P is important for actual tool recognition. What's very interesting is when we look at uh, both the T21 and T2P, and we try and see functionally which parts of the brain they connected with, they connected with the superior and middle frontal gyrus, which has all of the air, eight areas that we talked about in the first two weeks. And those eight areas are responsible for spatial working memory. So this part of the brain understands what an object is, and then it connects to a part of the brain that puts it in a certain space in our visual fields. Finally, the TF area, which is part of the anterior fusiform uh, gyrus, is very interesting because this is probably the most important facial recognition area we have. And this is evolutionary involved, uh, evolved. So when you look at uh, uh, blind people who were born blind and they've never seen a face in their life, and you put them through uh, a, uh, an fMRI and you start describing facial features like eyebrows, eyes, lips, etc. Even though they've never seen a face, this is the part of the brain that lights up. So our, our brains evolved to recognize faces as a very important function. Um, but it, it's also responsible for reading and object, uh, some aspects of object recognition as well.
Um, final, uh, the last two areas we're going to cover for the temporal lobe are the TG areas, which is part of the temporal pole. And if, if you've been following, I've been talking about the transmission of information from posteriorly to anteriorly. And as we get anteriorly, the encoding of uh, sensory information becomes increasingly complex. And that's what um, TGD and TGV do. Uh, these areas are connected to the inferior longitudinal fasciculus and the unsnit fasciculus, which ties this area uh, to the medial and inferior frontal lobes. So it's a, paralymb it's a paralymbic region. And what it does is it actually assigns emotional and social meaning to all the visual, auditory, and olfactory information that we get. So it's able to combine all those sensory modalities and give them an, an emotional and social value. TGD has the added function of working, being active when we're using verbal contrast. So if we think something's large versus small or tall versus short, the TGD is the path that, that lights up and allows us to do that. Similarly, TGV is also involved in verbal contra in visual contrast. So it's, it's involved in contrast, but unlike TGD, as opposed to using words, we're using vision. So if, we, if we're looking at dimensions of two objects visually and trying to figure out which one's larger and which is smaller, this is the area that lights up. And I guess it, it makes sense because TGD is closer to our Wernicke type of areas um, for speech and TGV is closer to the T21 and 2 areas which were responsible for secondary visual uh, processing. Finally, we're gonna look at our medial temporal areas. And um, this, this part has six parcellations. So EC for interrhinal uh, cortex, PEC for perianterrhinal cortex, uh, PRESS for uh, pre-subicular area, and PHA one, two, and three. Um, this is part of that PAPES circuit, that limbic system that connects to the cingulate gyrus. And we saw in our architectonic um, lecture that all this area is part of that archipallium so there's no surprise that the, the trapped anatomy of that is the cingulate bundle, but we've also got connections with the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. So if we look at the function, um, there's no surprise here. EC is uh, basically close to our hippocampus and it's involved in the rapid encoding of new information. So this is what we're using to create all our new memories. Uh, the perianterrhinal cortex, what that does is it contributes to um, our declarative memories and allows, it, it's a link between the enterrhinal cortex where we're creating new memories and storing that information in the, re the remainder of the cortex. Uh, pre, pre S or pre subiculum is interesting uh, in that it processes a lot of spatial information. And we've actually got a very interesting presentation of a brain tumor recently where they almost had an isolated brain tumor in this region. And this person was functioning absolutely normal. The only problem was is that they couldn't orientate themselves um, in space. So they couldn't orientate themselves around their home. Um, if they were to drive to their work, which they've done for many decades, suddenly they would get lost and go um, the completely wrong direction. So spatial information that was taken for granted their entire life became lost. And when you actually tie this in with connectomics, their presentation makes complete sense because the press actually encodes uh, spatial information. Finally, the PHA 1, 2, and 3 areas, uh, they, um, they allow us to recognize places, specifically PHA 1 and 2. And PHA 3 is important for tool recognition. So again, it's a whirlwind of, um, of two extra lobes of the brain and their parcellation maps. Uh, it, it is hectic, uh, but hopefully some of the more basic principles in terms of what they actually do um, have made sense. And, and certainly, uh, you know, as I've repeated before, in order to start analyzing these connectomes, you don't have to know, um, you know each parcellation in such encyclopedic detail. All right, so I'm going to uh, go on to a case. Um, it's, a, it's a lady with, uh, with pretty severe dementia. She, she's only 52. Um, she's not able to recognize people, not able to recognize objects. 
Uh, she's constantly laughing or crying. So she's got no regulation of emotion. And what does stick out is there is um, significant atrophy for a 52 year old um, and particularly in the temporal lobe um, areas uh, with almost complete atrophy in that insular area. So if we look at this, we can clearly see there's a problem. What becomes interesting is that, you know, there's some people that function normally with quite a bit of atrophy similar to this as well. So can we tell anything extra about this patient and their symptoms if, if we look at the connectomic map? And we're going to go into it so um, and look at it in more detail. But what I'm going to do initially, before I, I show you the, um, this MRI scan on the Omniscient platform, um, I'm just going to look at some of the basic networks that we can compare on the platform and look how, how they've actually changed for our patient with dementia compared to a control patient. And the reason I'm showing it to you like this is so you can make direct comparisons. So the first network that we looked at is the default mode network. So remember, it's that medial frontal area, that posterior cingulate area, and the interparietal sulci. And at an easy glance, you can see how compared to a normal brain, how much less volume there, are, there is in these networks. And interestingly, there's an asymmetry of, of the left side compared to the right side. Um, you can't really say that there's an asymmetry in the interparietal sulci because the default mode network is asymmetric with one parcellation in the interparietal area versus on the left versus two on, on the right. If we look at the central executive network, again, we can see less volume in our dementia patient compared to the a control patient. Um, and again, this is looking at the salience network where it's not too bad, but you can still see that there's a volume reduction. What becomes interesting, and especially when you're starting to look at the patient's symptoms of you know, memory problems, uh, uncontrolled emotions, that um, limbic paralimbic network is severely reduced when you actually look at the the structural connectivity of that network in our dementia patient versus a normal patient. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share. Um, I don't know, is, is Jerry on? Okay. Um, Jerry, can you, can you begin to load that case? Yeah, sure, I'm loading the case. Um, do you want me to share my screen? Um, Chris is loaded. Do you want me to share the screen? Okay. Just give me a sec. I might. I'm just trying to. What I'll do, Jerry, is keep it on. And then for now, mm. I'm going to share my screen and then yep. we'll switch to yours. Sure. So we'll just wait for it to download. We've just been experiencing some uh, some slow internet today. So that's why I've got Jerry on. Um, if it's showing some delay, then I'll just get Jerry to load it. I think, uh, Jerry, I think I'm going to go off and then you can just uh, show your screen. That's okay. Okay. Sure, I'm sharing now. Okay, 
Um, so Jerry, can you, can you start by taking off the, the tracts and the parcellations? So on, the, on under the controls, if you can just get rid of the tracts and the parcellations on your right. Okay, so, so what we've got here is we've got the brain structure, because as we've explained uh, previously, what we're able to do with the omniscient platform is use a structural MRI, a diffusion MRI to look at all the tracts, and then we're able to overlay the bold imaging for functional connectivity. Um, so what we can do is, so Jerry, can you maximize the bottom right corner? Yeah, that one. So that's our structure and we can see brain atrophy, large ventricles, um, very big sylvian fissures, um, atrophic temporal lobes. Can you add the, um, can you add the, um, the tract? So now what we're doing is we're overlaying all the, all the white matter tracts in the brain. Um, and based on this, then we're able to build our Glasser Atlas. So if you can overlay now the, the parcellation map, Jerry. So the machine learning is able to understand where all these tracts are and assign the uh, 720 Glasser areas. So before we look at the, the function of this brain, um, it's important to look at some of the basic structure of the networks. So Jerry, on the left, can you pick the uh, default mode network? So this is the structure of the default mode network where we've got the medial anterior frontal cortices, uh, the posterior cingulate areas and the interparietal sulci. And from experience, you, um, and that's why I showed you, um, this, you guys a slide before we went into this there's decreased volume of, of this network, which of course is attributed to the atrophy. Okay, can you take this network off and show us a central executive network? So here we're looking at the dorsolateral prefrontal cortices and those interparietal uh, sulci and uh, the middle cingulate areas. Again, based on the brain atrophy, there's decreased volume of that network. Uh, you can take that away. And this is the network responsible for external thinking, um, whereas the default mode uh, network is important for internal thinking. Then if you can just put the salience network on, take that one, yeah, take the CN off. So here's that uh, the switch network, which a very important hub is that anterior insula that we talked about. So this network ties in with the anterior insula and allows us to switch between external and internal thinking. So this is the structure of this network in this brain. And again, compared to what we see in a normal brain, there's quite a bit of decreased volume. Uh, now, the last one that I wanna look at is that limbic paralimbic network. I go up, go up, Jerry, take off the salience. Yeah, and then click on that one. So when we're looking at this network and, and we're comparing it to a normal brain, there's, uh, Re reduce volume fairly significantly in this in this network. Okay, so now that we've got our different networks, uh, Jerry, can you go to the connectomic? So just clear everything and let's start maximize the anomaly detection. And then just click on the default mode network. Okay, so what the anomaly detection does is now that the machine learning has recognized where each one of these parcellations are, it's able to, to take the bold signal from the resting state functional MRI and assign a value to, um, to each, a bold value to each of the parcellations uh, of the brain. And what we're able to do with the anomaly detection is compare our patients a bold connectivity, a functional connectivity, to a database of 300 normal young adult brains uh, with any with no neurological problems or any psychiatric illness. And we able at a glance to see which parts of the brain are abnormal. So if you've got a white area, the connectivity between two parcellations uh, on the X and Y axis is normal. If you've got a black area, there's too much variation based on our current sample, which is going to increase to more than 2000 patients to, um, to, to pick an abnormality. Um, 
if it's red or blue, it means the connectivity is overconnected or underconnected. And we'll just wait for Jerry to, to reload. Sorry. Click on the wrong button. Okay. So we can just go back to that default mode network. Okay, so just to summarize, if it's white, connections between two postulations is normal. If it's black, too much variation at present uh, based on our sample size to make a conclusion, red or blue is under or over connected. So if we look at this patient with dementia, the default mode network actually looks good. So their internal thinking. Okay, so unclick that and let's look at the central executive network. Um, again, the central executive network uh, areas appear normal, uh, so we can get rid of that. Now, let's look at the salience network, so the switching mechanism. Now, we're starting to see some red and some, uh, some blue areas in that salience network. And if you look at the scan, we've got a lot of atrophy in the insula and the temporal area. And that's to be expected because major hubs of the salience network are in that insular area. So part of the problem with this patient is potentially the switching between normal uh, default mode networks and central executive networks. Now, if, if you um, just scroll a little bit more to the right. Okay. Okay. So what we'll do next is to click out of, click out of this one, uh, Jerry. Uh, the salience, unclick it. No, stay there, stay there. Unclick the salience. And then let's look at the limbic paralimbic network. So we said lots of uh, temporal atrophy. Let's see what's happening. So again, what we're seeing here is, is problems, the T to A. So we covered uh, that today. So the press, it's important for spatial um, orientation, T to A, visual uh, recognition of objects. Uh, so patients clearly got problems with that. Um, if you go to the TGV on the very right, on the very right, um, that was important for, for tying in our olfactory, audiovisual and auditory information uh, and allowing us to discriminate between objects. So again, we're starting to see problems in, in that network. But what becomes very interesting is when we start combining this limbic and paralimbic network with um, the central executive network. So let's, let's now combine the two networks. No, sorry, Jerry, actually what I want you to do is take off the uh, limbic and paralimbic. Take off the limbic. And now I want you to do a salience and a CEN. And then can you, can you maximize that a, a, a bit more? It's a little bit difficult to see on the screen. Scroll up. Okay, good. So what we've done, so when we looked at the central executive network on its own, it was pretty pristine. And when we started looking at the salience network, there were a few abnormalities. But when we actually combining the two networks, now remember that the, the salience network is a switch mechanism for the central executive and the default mode network. Now we start to get multiple uh, red and blue areas. So it's picking up that we've potentially got problems with that switching mechanism, which might explain a lot of this, uh, this patient's uh, problems. So if we look at the, the T1M, um, or go back to that T1M, T1M, okay, so just, just start taking the columns. Okay, stay on that PSL, stay on that PC, uh, PSL. Go to the very left, go to the very left. Okay, so our PSL, multiple, uh, multiple abnormalities. And that's important, remember, is um, enhancing cognition. So tying in a lot of um, sensory information to enhance our cognitive experience. Um, move now to the right. Let's just see a few other ones. Uh, so frontal opercular uh, five will create language problems to that extended Wernicke's area, which this, this patient does have. Move on to the right, slowly. Uh, no, no, go more back. Uh, 
Um, our area 46, again, language problems. Um, move on more to the right, more to the right. More to the right. So the, the poll one and two, um, our auditory areas, uh, which we talked about earlier today, showing problems more to the right. The T1M, uh, we talked about uh, tertiary visual areas. Um, so what we can do is we can actually click on these parcellations and now minimize, uh, Jerry. So just show us the brain where these parcellations are. So we've actually, by picking the different areas, we can actually see where they're, where they're originating in the brain and where potential problems are. But I guess the take home lesson here is when you're looking at someone with dementia from just a structural brain, which shows global atrophy, we can start to understand how it's affecting the different networks. And on a functional map, we can see how that salience network is interacting with uh, the default mode and the central executive networks. And we're picking up a lot more abnormalities in that interaction between the networks as opposed to the networks in isolation. So it's plausible that this patient is experiencing a lot of their problems because of predominantly problems in their insular and temporal lobe, which is making the control mechanism of their cognitive functions through the DMN and CEN um, aberrant. Um, so I'll leave that there with this case. Uh, thank you, Jerry, for waking up from Sydney to, um, to, to show us the case. Um, and that concludes our session for this week. Next week, we're going to finish off our parcellation map by looking at the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe, again, complex areas. We're going to finish all the lobes a week early. So what I'm going to do in, in my last session before we go back to Sydney in the, in the final, final session is look at a few of the different diseases and try and understand them from a connectome point of view. I look at some of the TMS literature and just try and tie in a lot of the information uh, that we've covered over the last few weeks and, and how that aids us to understand um, different types of diseases. Uh, thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, and, and thank you, Jerry, as well for, I'm not sure what time it must be in Sydney, but a very early morning. Thank you for joining us and assisting. Uh, Chris, thank you again for a brilliant session. These sessions, excuse the pun, absolutely blow my mind uh, every time, but thank you. Um, as I mentioned, the recording, I will put the recording up on YouTube uh, by tomorrow, Friday at the latest, uh, and you can use the link I shared. I'll post in the chat one more time. Um, but otherwise, I think everybody have a, have a good evening, uh, and we will see you again next week. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Jerry. Thanks, everyone.